Christian and Muslim perspectives on the feminine in our scriptures. My name is Marilyn Moulton, and I'm the director of the Renison Institute of Ministry. And this series on faith in the feminine is co-sponsored by the Institute of Ministry, and together with studies in Islam, an interdisciplinary program that's also housed here at Renison University College. This series is the result of many conversations, many planning sessions, and now, only because you are here, is it a reality. So thank you for coming. <laughs> a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. What we're hoping for is that at the heart of the series will be dialogue. And it's the hope of the organizing committee, whom I'll introduce in a moment, that each one of us will experience an uh, inviting and safe space where we can hear the perspectives and experiences of others, and also where you can share your experiences and perspectives too. You each received a folder. I hope when you came in, did everyone get one? Inside, there is an outline that has a chart that looks something like this. And that's our roadmap for the next two hours. I'll finish up soon with a few introductory remarks. And then we'll have three presentations. At the end of that, we'll have some time of silence, um, some time for prayerful reflection, if that's your practice, and to let some of the things we've heard sink in. And then there'll be time for a break. You can go and refresh your coffee and tea, but you can move over there to get a snack anytime uh, during the day as well. There's also um, a little time for a washroom break. There's a washroom right outside here for women. And the men just have to walk across the cafeteria and it's on the other side there. After we have our break, we'll move into a time of small group dialogue. And finally, there'll be some time for dialogue with each other and with the presenters as a large group. So that's our roadmap. But the journey along the way will create as we go along. There are a few hopes that we have for today. We hope that we'll listen attentively to one another, as I said. That we'll appreciate differing points of view. We welcome and hope there are different uh, points of view and that we will appreciate those. That you will give freely of your own experiences. And of all the things that there are to talk about together, today, we ask that you confine your discussion to the topic we've chosen, which is understanding the feminine in our scriptures. It will be tempting, I know, to talk about all kinds of other things, but if we can try to stay focused on that together, that would be helpful. I'd now like to introduce you to the other members of the organizing committee and to the presenters. You'll notice there's a bit of an overlap here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so first, our first presenter will be Carol McMullen, who is over here on my left and on your far right. Carol is a lay service leader and er, lay service leader and music leader at Temple Shalom, which is the Reformed Jewish congregation in the Waterloo region. She has studied extensively across the spectrum of Judaism here in KW, in Toronto, New York, and Israel. She is especially interested in the feminine characteristics of the Hebrew Bible, is a member of several interfaith study groups and interfaith Grand River, and participates in various interfaith forums. In her other life, she's a specialist, and I would say a highly respected specialist, with a private practice in the disorders of ADHD, Asperger's, learning disabilities, and acquired brain injuries. And Carol is also one of the three members of the organizing committee. So please welcome Carol. Our second presenter in the middle is the Reverend Ken Cannon Tanya Fitz. She is an Anglican priest currently serving an uh, Anglican parish in Stratford where she lives with her husband and two children. She's one of the coordinators of gatherings of Anglican clergy across southwestern Ontario who come together to support one another and share their ministry experiences. Since 2007, she's also been the ecumenical officer of the Diocese of Huron, which is most of southwestern Ontario. And Tanya enjoys sharing the stories of scripture through teaching, preaching, and storytelling. Warm welcome to Tanya. And to 
Instead, he cited a verse saying that the fruit of a woman's body is blessed from the fruit of a man's body. Enraged, Yalta storms into the basement and apparently, according to the story, smashes 400 bottles of wine in the cellar. So here is an early example of a woman enraged at being sidelined. Significant that this story would be passed to us through the Orthodox Jewish circles, however. I had never heard of such a story until I studied with, um, in an Orthodox setting in Toronto, and there's this cool story. We are enraged with her. In recent times, modern female scholars have been highlighting and reinterpreting the, royal, the roles of our biblical women in fascinating and refreshing ways. <coughs> Some of these do not so much contradict traditional interpretation, so much as shine a spotlight on aspects more often passed by in earlier writings being most often produced by the male scholars. Rabbi Elise Goldstein from Toronto has inspired many female scholars of this past decade with her book, Revisions, Seeing the Torah Through a Feminist Lens. I actually brought her book and a number of other books that I put on a, in the, on a chair in the back corner over there by the, by the coffee. She has been a personal mentor for me in my quest to find personal meaning in our scriptures and in Judaism as a woman. With the inquisitive focus on the feminine perspective to these familiar stories, we come to see biblical women quite differently. Eve, her name, her Hebrew name is Chava, is a thinker. It is she, not Adam, um, who's the one initially fascinated by the notion of being able to discern the difference between good and evil. <coughs> she is intellectually curious and wants to expand her limitations in the Garden of Eden. She reaches out for what she intuitively knew would bring moral consciousness into the world, the fullness of life, and that is the meaning of her name, Chava, like Lachayim, uh, like to life. The text says nothing about her as a seductress or a temptress. Adam is right there for the entire scene, makes no protest, and participates equally. One note on Sarah, what I'm going to do is just run through some of the different biblical <coughs> women with these different perspectives. So the next person that I'm going to focus on is Rebecca, but one note on Sarah before that. The complex story is told in our scripture of the near sacrifice of Isaac by his own father. That son is Ishmael in the Quran, as we know. At any rate, in our Jewish story, Abraham undertakes what he perceives to be this test from God without telling either Isaac or Sarah of his plan. The text does not record any further dialogue ever again between Abraham and Isaac, between father and son, and we can certainly understand perhaps why he knew that might have been. Um, and the next we hear of Sarah is of her death. Even traditional commentators presume that the news to her of Abraham's plan or his return from Moriah without Isaac caused her sudden death. A modern Orthodox writer, Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg, explore, explores with some psychological depth <coughs> the result of this traumatic experience on Isaac for the rest of his life. Rebecca has married and likely nourished, uh, nur nurtured this damaged individual and would be intimately aware of his limitations. At the time of him asking Esau to kill some game in order to receive the blessing before he dies, we are told that Isaac is almost blind. His eyes are dimmed. This could be physical blindness, or as we know in retrospect, emotional blindness, to the unsuitability of Esau to carry on the line of the Jewish people. As we see later with Joseph, Moses, David, and Solomon, it is often not the firstborn son who is chosen for the lead role. Rebecca knew that Jacob was required, was the required choice, and so she carefully did what was, in, what was needed to ensure that it happened that way. When the prophets Samuel and Nathan do not choose the firstborn, we accept that at face value. David is the youngest of seven brothers. Solomon is number 10 of 18 brothers by his father David's wives, as well as others of his concubines. The text does not condemn Rebecca for her choice. And the complex plan to make that choice happen in her role as a woman. And neither do our traditional commentaries. But Rebecca has been condemned in some other contexts, which have placed her in a negative, conniving female role. Moving to some
some other women. Many women in the Bible are actually given very clear leadership roles, in fact. Miriam it has a parallel role to Aaron in the story of Moses. And as an added feature in this story, Moses' life <coughs> was saved by a series of strong and courageous women. We have both Egyptian and Hebrew women who conspired together to thwart um, Pharaoh's decree to murder all the Hebrew baby boys. Shifra and Hua, the midwives, Pharaoh's daughter, Moses' mother, and his sister Miriam appear to have had an ongoing influence in his upbringing as well, because he clearly identifies Moses um, with the Hebrew slaves when he kills the overseer that was um, abusing a Hebrew slave. That connection is very clear, and most likely he got that with continuing connection with the women in his life. Later, his wife, Sephora, quickly intercedes to save Moses' life from God, from God's apparent wrath by circumcising their son. Miriam is a prophet. She is celebrated with a special song, as is Deborah the judge. And legend, or Midrash, says that a well of water followed the Hebrews all through the desert years of their wanderings through the merit of Miriam, thus called Miriam's well. And at many modern seders, Along with Elijah's cup of wine, which is part of the Seder, we now have a Miriam's cup of water um, that goes along in our, in our Seders. <coughs> Some Seders, not all Seders. <laughs> Next we have uh, King David's wives, Michal and uh, Abigail, each of whom who play prominently in this story. And Bathsheba, who may have had a foreshadowing sense of her crucial role in the messianic line of both Judaism and Christianity. She may have been very intentionally bathing by a window or in an exposed area where David could see her from the rooftop. She seems to have come willingly to the palace when he calls for her, and she surely would have played a key role in raising Solomon to be the king of such renowned wisdom. Furthermore, she must have held much political power um, to be in collusion with the prophet Nathan to ensure Solomon's ascension to the throne on David's deathbed because that was not at all happening. Um, another son was busy getting in there and trying to make this all happen. It was Bathsheba, Bathsheba and Nathan that were making this all happen and she couldn't have just started doing that when David was sick in bed. Actually, rather rev reminiscent of Rebecca's role. We can list many other women earlier in the book of Genesis who take crucial story roles. Lot's daughters who believe that after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, that they and their father are indeed the only survivors left to ensure the survival of humanity. So that is why they make their father drunk in order to have sexual relations with him. It's a very different spin on it. Hagar, who suffers under Sarah's hostility as the mother of Ishmael. My understanding is that most Islamic traditions consider Ishmael to be the ancestor of the Arab people, some excluding Arabs who are the descendants of Yarub, and you can help me out to, later to explain how this works. This is new for me just in doing this research. And that the Prophet Muhammad was from the Ishmael descendant tribes, whether or not from the, from the Yarub line, but I'm definitely out of my depth. Back to our women. Tamar, who poses as a prostitute in order to force her father-in-law Judah to procreate with her, an earlier link in the Messianic line leading to David. Rahab, who helps Joshua's spies and is listed in the New Testament as the mother of Boaz, who married Ruth. So again, more of these links with some very colorful women. And for some good Jewish humor, we have the story of Rachel who steals her father's family idols when <laughs> Jacob finally decides to leave and return back home. When Laban discovers that they're missing, he races out in hot pursuit and accuses Jacob of theft. Jacob invites him to search the tents, so Rachel quickly sits on them, apologizing that she cannot rise before her father because she's on her monthly period. <laughs> it's in there! It's in there! <laughs> Hilarious to imagine this as a dramatic scene, except for the sad consequence of her premature demise because, Lab the, because Jacob promises to Laban um, death to whoever has these idols. 
Laban never actually finds the idols, but it is in fact Rachel that has them, and so the commentaries say that that was linked to her premature death. True tragedy when their love story is so thoroughly and tenderly described in the text. And a topic of some discussion in Jewish circles that our monotheism was not yet fully established, perhaps. All sorts of um, discussion about why there were family idols, why she was taking them, how these idols were being used, and certainly as a monotheistic religion, kind of interesting that there's still very much the, the, the idol business still happening. Then later we have Ruth, the Moabite woman who is held up as a model for conversion to Judaism. She marries Boaz, and thus is woven into the Messianic Davidic line as well. She has an entire book devoted to her story, which is read yearly on the holiday of Shavuot, the holiday after Passover, where Jews celebrate receiving the Torah at Mount Sinai. Ruth's emigration from Moab parallels the Jewish exodus from Egypt, and her conversion to Judaism parallels the Jews accepting the Torah at Sinai. Then we have Deborah and Yael, and they are rather a unique exam, um, examples of women warriors. Deborah being an actual judge and a prophet, uh, one of the seven, seven women designated by traditional rabbis as prophets. There's 49 men designated as prophets and seven women. And the seven women are Sarah, Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, Abigail, Huldah, and Esther. Esther saves the entire Jewish people from extinction during an ancient extermination attempt by the king of Persia's vizier, uh, Haman. Her being chosen as queen is, pre is preceded by a short but very dramatic snippet where the current queen, Vashti, is called by the king to dance in front of his entire male court wearing only her tiara at a drunken bank in a drunken banquet that he is holding. And again, in Sunday school stories, I never meant <laughs> and I thought, no, nah, that's not really in there, but when you read it, it's, she's only wearing her crown, or her, her tiara. And she refuses, of course. Um, her action causing havoc throughout the court. The text, right in the text, it talks about the advisors being terrified at her defiance and that this will cause all women throughout the kingdom to do the same. So he issues a decree <laughs> that all women must obey their husbands and who are to be the rulers in their own home, and Vashti is banished. Sounds kind of mild compared to what I would have expected, but the text doesn't go into any more detail than just that she was banished. So as the new queen to replace Vashti, one would expect Esther to be a meek and subservient doormat. Instead, she works strategically with her uncle Mordecai to use her position of privilege in the court to try to influence the king to save the, Jew, the Jews from Haman's extermination plot. If she fails, she risks death herself and all her people. Her courage, dignity, and pride in her Jewishness are a model for young Jewish children during the annual festival of Purim where kids and observant adults dress up in costumes and act out the story with full drama. It's one interesting thing when I was in Israel. I happened to be on one of my trips there um, in February, and in Jerusalem, all the little street shops have Halloween costumes imported from China and the U.S. For just <laughs> ma masses of Halloween costumes for everyone to to dress up in for Purim, and that was really quite fun for me to see, and, and where they were all made. These <laughs> Not so much witches and devils, more princesses and, and cowboys and, and that kind of stuff. So there isn't the, in Purim, there isn't the, the underlay of, of the Halloween here. It's just the costumes and the pranks, and for instance, at Temple Shalom, I don't know if this was the time when you were there. One of the th at one of the parties, people were blowing out Shabbat candles, and Shabbat candles are a very, very important, sacred obligation on a Friday night. You never blow them out; they they go down by themselves. So number one, they're lighting them at the wrong time, and contests and squirting them with water guns, and and men dress up as women, and every it's complete topsy turvy. Um, holiday, it's, it's quite a lot of fun. And, but the serious part goes back to this, this very important role that, that Esther played. 
Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel, provides the first recorded example of spontaneous prayer in, recorded in the Hebrew Bible. When the high priest Eli accuses her of being drunk, she stands up to him strongly and brings him around, resulting in his blessing for her. And the birth a year later of her son Samuel. Hannah's example of prayer is used by the rabbis as an integral, integral model for Jewish prayer. Besides the stories of these women archetypes, references in the Hebrew Bible give us some idea of their position in the community. While tribal and property rights were trans transferred through the male lineage, an individual is considered Jewish by having a Jewish mother. Until recently, when some reform, which is the group that I'm with, liberal reform Jews, said if we're going to be egalitarian, instead of having it just come through women, if there's one male, if there's a father, then the Jewish line can come through that. But most of mainline Judaism absolutely does not accept that. Um, every Sabbath evening, Proverbs 31 is read in honor of the woman of the family. This proverb describes women as buying and working land, engaging in business, showing wisdom, majesty, strength, and kindness. No oppression in that part. At Sinai, the Torah was delivered to both men and women, binding both to the covenant. If the recorded numbers are of any relevance, we are told that some 1,200,000 men and women were at Sinai. If even 500,000 family units were included with approximately three or four children each, estimates range from two to three million people receiving the covenant together. In no other religion does this mass of people receive a revelation all at once. With the story being retold yearly at the family Passover Seder meals, prepared mostly, of course, by women, it may help explain why this tradition has persisted for more than 3,000 years, despite the never-ending attempts to stamp it out and to eradicate the Jewish people. The role of women in this profound mystery has been acknowledged by all streams of Judaism for the centuries. Throughout this history, Jewish women have indeed struggled for some aspects of equality along with their non-Jewish counterparts. Women's marital rights, however, have been laid out from antiquity in a prenup contract known as the Ketubah. So, we've been doing it for long. <laughs> the rabbis have legislated against domestic violence. Women in abusive or desperately unhappy marriages have the option for divorce. But these safeguards have not always been followed. Orthodox women need the consent of the husband for divorce. Men do not need the wife's consent. While women have many of the same covenantal obligations as men, Orthodox women's continuing primary roles as mothers and housekeepers is the main rationale for limiting their participation in synagogue ritual and management. The increased attention, uh, attendance, sorry, the increased attendance of Jewish girls at post-secondary levels of education, as well as the widespread increase in television and social media, have exposed orthodox students of both genders to secular feminist movements and ideas. So as a result, most, most orthodox groups are expanding the scope of female participation and scholarship at varying rates. While there is a backlash from some ultra-orthodox groups, especially in Israel, where women's voices in some areas are not being heard on the radio, they're not having women, pictures of women on signs, there is a bit of a backlash going on. The move toward a wider range of egalitarian awareness and practice is both inevitable and progressing with much speed. What are known as family purity laws are of concern to many non-Jewish onlookers. Modern Jewish women who have abandoned these practices are not so much concerned as indifferent. Let me explain a little. The prohibition against physical contact with a man during a woman's menstrual period can be interpreted with a very negative take on the unfortunate term ritual impurity. However, blood is a life force in Judaism that holds intense meaning. Blood cannot be consumed in meat, and that's one of the kosher restrictions. When a woman is bleeding, she needs some extra consideration and tender loving care. The prohibition against sexual relations during this time is meant to provide a break for women, a time for rest and space. 
a time for the woman to focus inward on the miracle of her body cycle and on her inner spirituality rather than on her role as a nurturer and sexual partner. Men are expected to show restraint and self-control during this time. Those in happy relationships say that the anticipation of resuming this aspect after the monthly period of abstinence augments the joy of the physical reunion. This issue is developed with great artistry in Anita Diamond's The Red Tent. Some of you have a little Modesty rules for those who practice them are somewhat parallel for men and women. Both cover arms and legs fairly thoroughly and wear a head covering. Women, women's head coverings being more extensive with a scarf, hat, or even a wig. This is in the more orthodox practice. Orthodox men have beards and possibly sidewalks. <coughs> they also wear an extra undergarment with fringes. Actually, in the um, New Testament story about the woman <coughs> grabbing on to the, the corners and the fringes of Jesus' garment, that is probably what it refers to as his, his um, fringe garment. I have personally been profoundly moved by two seminars that I have recently attended on the head covering and modesty issues by Muslim women. Their perspective has increased my understanding of Orthodox Jewish practice and that of Old Order Mennonites, Amish, and Catholic nuns. We all have much to consider in my view on this issue and can learn from our Muslim sisters. In closing, I offer a final thought on the possibly the most mysterious of our biblical women, the witch or medium of Endor. Her work as an oracle has been banned by the king, but still she practices and is well known and respected under the threat of death. How incredible that an unnamed woman practicing an illegal craft becomes an advisor to King Saul. Rabbi Gila Rizel Raphael describes her as our archetype for women's spiritual and psychic abilities. Chaim Vital, a 16th century Kabbalist male, states that women emerged as prominent diviners and ecstatic prophets precisely because these areas were beyond rabbinic control where gifted women could develop their own unique ways. We have clear and continuing link links to modern neo-pagan women with whom some of us have had some fascinating dialogue through interfaith Grand River. I very much look forward to expanding my knowledge and understanding of the feminine perspective in both the Christian and Muslim scriptures as well, and wish to express my deepest gratitude to Marilyn and Adrissa for organizing this opportunity. I was, I was a sidebar on this, these, these two get older. <laughs> Um, this is an amazing opportunity for us to share and learn together. The perspectives of women in our faith traditions have the complexity of an intricate tapestry. We each bring threads of various textures and hues woven into flowing lines, small and tight knots, flower blossoms, or ripples in the river of light. Let us celebrate both our connectedness and our fascinating differences. And let us further weave these perspectives into those of the men, with the, of, of the men whom we love, with whom we live and work with, and who want to connect with us on this journey. And welcome to the men who have come today to be with us. Thank you. The New Testament and women. Um, the New Testament is not one simple book that starts at the beginning and goes for about 200 pages or so. It's actually made up of 27 different books. And this is important when we talk a little later about where some of the uh, traditional ideas come from and where they fit into the history of the Christian faith. So it's made up of 27 books, four gospels, gospel meaning good news, and in this case, the good news of Jesus, who is indeed um, the focus of the Christian religion. The Acts of the Apostles, which is a historical look at what the first Christians did and how Christianity spread in the beginning. Letters, or you might have heard the term epistles, because in the church we have to use complicated words for just about everything, I think. Um, so the letters, and there are various authors for the letters, and the book of Revelation, which is, is apocalyptic literature. It's literature about the end times. So to begin, let's talk about the female disciples in the gospel. There will be those who tell you that there weren't really female disciples that there were women who cooked and cleaned for Jesus, because that, of course, is what the women were supposed to do. 
But what the scripture says is that certain women had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. There's two important things in that sentence. One is that the term used, especially in the Gospel of Mark, for had followed, does not mean they tailed around behind the boys. What it means is it's the same term used to describe the male followers of Jesus. That in the aspect of their faith, in the aspect of their teaching role, in the aspect of their discipleship, they were equal with the male disciples who are named in the Gospels. That they followed in the same way that the men followed. And they had provided for him. These women were the ones who financed Jesus' travels. Which means they were women who had some property in their own right somehow, which would have been unusual, and that they were women who had the ability and the authority to make the decision on how those funds were spent. These women were also present at the crucifixion. When some of the male followers run away, the women are still standing by the cross. The foot of the cross in some gospels, away from the cross in others, but they are there. And the typical way of women to stand with those who are in distress, to be with those who are injured, and to stay with those we love on their deathbeds. But the role of the women in the Gospels was to be present when their Lord and Master was dying. And then, and then they are the first witnesses to the resurrection. The central happening of the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did he appear first to these 12 disciples, male disciples who are named and who followed him? No, when he appears, and only in two Gospels is there actually an appearance immediately following the tomb, it is to women. It is slightly different in the Gospels as to which women he appeared to, but he is appearing to women in the Gospels, which would have certainly, from a legal standpoint, been somewhat difficult because women weren't considered actually legal witnesses. So Jesus wasn't worried about that, though. He wasn't worried about legalities. He was appearing to his followers, and he appeared to women. What do we see in Jesus' life when he meets with women in the New Testament? Mary and Martha, two women who were friends of his, at whose house he ate, who he raised their brother from the dead, and who were with him near the end as well. In his healings, he heals women as much as he does men. There doesn't seem to be a bias between them, though I admit I didn't go through the Gospels and count. <laughs> Somebody probably has, but I wasn't going to. There are some very profound stories of Jesus' interactions with women in the New Testament. The woman at the well, and I would encourage you to read that. That's one of the great stories of Jesus in the New Testament, speaking with a woman who is considered an outcast, Healing her not physically, but in other ways that perhaps are more important than physical healing. The woman with the hemorrhage that Carol alluded to, and in the same story, he raises a man's daughter from the dead. A little girl who many in that cultural context would have very little value. Even today in some cultures, perhaps, would be seen to have very little value. And yet Jesus goes out of his way to raise her from the dead. And the Syrophoenician woman's daughter who Jesus isn't going to heal at first. She comes to him and she begs for healing for her daughter, and Jesus says, why should I do that? You're not even a Jew. And she argues with him and convinces Jesus to change his mind. This is a woman who is not afraid to stand up for what she believes is right, who is not afraid to stand up for her friends and family, and who is not afraid to challenge the one from whom she needs a great gift. And Jesus gives her the gift she needs, he responds to both her need, but also to her understanding and her power of who she is. We want to look at how things switch from the Gospels and into our culture. There is probably no greater example in the Christian scriptures than Mary Magdalene. Disciple or penitent? How many of you here, maybe some of the younger ones haven't, have seen or heard Jesus Christ Superstar? I live in Stratford, and they had a great production of it about a year ago. And there's a song she sings, I don't know how to love him. It's probably one of the more sensual songs in 
Jesus Christ Superstar. But it's based on an understanding of Mary Magdalene that has become so ingrained in our culture that it is a cultural touchstone and yet doesn't really have any foundation in our Gospels. Who was Mary Magdalene? The Gospels tell us she was one of the women who followed Jesus. She was present at the crucifixion. She was the first to see Jesus after the resurrection, particularly in the Gospel of John, which is a very um, touching account of her meeting with her risen Lord. That Jesus cast out seven demons from her. Nowhere in the scripture does it say those demons are sexual. But that is the understanding that has developed over time. She is the only woman who follows Jesus in the New Testament who is not defined by an attachment. She's not listed as somebody's wife or somebody's mother. She's just Mary Magdalene, or Mary of Magdala, which may have been what scared folks about her, which may have been why there was the assumption that her sins were sexual rather than other sins of other kinds, if her demons were sexual. This is Titan's painting of Mary of Magdala. You can tell a lot about how culture views things by their art. So a, Middle Age, a painting from the Middle Ages of a penitent sinner. You can see the emphasis on Mary's sexuality there. The long flowing red hair. The sense that she is uh, somehow sorry for the sins of her body. Carvaccio's painting of Mary of Magdalene. Again, focusing on her sexuality. Somehow, <coughs> Over time, interpretation, the patriarchal culture transformed her from a disciple of Christ to a whore. She becomes closely linked to the sinner who anoints Jesus in Luke's Gospel and to Mary of Bethany. The only connection between those three characters in the Gospels is that they all anointed Jesus at one time. They're not the same person. She also was linked historically at times to the woman at the well and to the woman taken adultery in the book of John. And the confusion about these women is apparent dating back to the third century in writings. Gregory the Great declared that Mary was that Mary Magdalene, the sinner in Luke, and Mary of Bethany are all the same person. Though it was in 1969 really that Pope Pius stated that they were not the same person. But we don't forget 1400 years of history overnight. So the question is, what do we do with women in the scriptures? How do we get back, in Mary Magdalene's case, to look at what was in the scriptures rather than years of cultural overlay over it? If we move on to the epistles, or what do we do with Paul? Um, <laughs> Paul is the um, writer of some of the epistles. Some may have been written by Paul and others aren't. What's important, I think, for us maybe today um, to concentrate on is Galatians is the earliest letter. The le order they are in the New Testament is not the order the books in the New Testament were written in. Galatians is the earliest letter written, and in fact, the earliest of the New Testament books to be written. So what that means for us is that it's closest likely, in terms of some of it, to the original teachings of Jesus, because they haven't had as long to get mixed up. How many of you played telephone when you were a kid? <laughs> you whisper to your friend, and by the time you get it all the way around the circle, it means something completely different than it did the first person? That can sometimes happen a bit in oral tradition. Cultural overlays come in, and things are changed. What Paul says in the letter to the Galatians is that there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying to the Christians at Galatia that what matters here for you is your faith. And if you share the faith, there are no, any, no longer any distinctions between you the culture would put upon you. That you are all one in Christ Jesus. Later, of course, in some other letters, and this is where sometimes we get stuck with Paul and with some of the other epistle writers is, of course, probably the two that's in everybody's minds. The restriction on women speaking in church and the uh, wives obey your husbands. Well, 
there are a few things that you can do to kind of look at that and help you kind of work with that in your own faith. One is to understand the influence of household codes and other cultural norms. Some of Paul's letters also say, slaves, obey your masters. And we look at that now and we say, well, that's because of the context and the time in which Paul lived. So therefore, he's reiterating some of the household, household codes, and he's speaking out of his culture. I don't think any of us would agree these days that there should be slavery, and that slaves, if you were a slave, you need to obey your master. We would, in fact, probably encourage you to break the bonds of slavery and move away. Um, and yet we pick and choose other verses which we say should be obeyed without comment. So we have to take a look at ourselves and about how we, as individuals, as church, as communities, look at those sayings. Some of the problematic areas are also to be found in letters that not all scholars agree were written by Paul, and in fact some that they're pretty sure were not written by Paul. Given that we accept them as part of our canon of scripture, our faith, how much important that is is something that I think each of us kind of has to work through for ourselves. Um, but it might help <coughs> understand that maybe the later people who wrote under Paul's name, as was not uncommon for disciples to do of a certain teacher, that perhaps they might not have gotten the teacher's teaching exactly right either, and that that might be why. And some of it, again, is cultural. We talk about, women, the, one of the letters says women shouldn't speak in church, but I suspect not a few of you grow up wearing hats to church. Because it also says women should cover their heads in church. And yet, in very few Christian churches today, do women cover their heads. Or if they do, it's their choice. It's not a requirement. So why would one requirement be more important than another? And that's something I think that we continue to struggle with, is how do we balance the different and competing thoughts and how do we look at some of these things? So how do we move forward? How do we deal with some of these parts of scripture that are difficult if we want to look at gender equality, if we want to look at gender justice, if we want to look at how to live together in harmony between men and women and how the scriptures teach us to live, and how does that all fit together? There are a few ways to look at that at this. One is to peel away the tradition to see the text with fresh eyes. Go back to the scriptures. Try and look at the scriptures without the cultural, without the years of overlay traditional. Particularly if you look at someone like Mary Magdalene that way, you may have a very different idea than the one you grew up with in Sunday school. Um, because that Sunday school model is all the penitent. And yet if we look at scripture, there is no support for that witness. So how does that happen? How can we look at scripture with new eyes? It's hard for those of us who grew up in a tradition, in a faith, to do that. Because so much of what we see has been conditioned from the time we were very young. But if you do it, it can open your eyes to new things that can expand your faith and your understanding of your tradition as well. For Christians to consider the text in the light of the overall teachings of Jesus. Jesus is the center of our faith. And if something that's said in one of Paul's letters or in somebody else, another letter or another Christian writing, does not agree with the teachings of Jesus, then we need to ask some very hard questions about what that means and about what we do with that. Consider the cultural context of the original text. So we need to understand the culture that some of the texts came out of in order to understand how they can speak to us in our culture today and trust the voice of God within you. Sometimes when we get uh, wrapped up in looking at scripture and looking or looking at theology, we forget to look at our experience of God. We forget to hear the voice that is within us that can help us peel away some of the difficult things, that help, can help us struggle with some of the difficulties, that can help us hear the God who calls us to it, him in the words of Jesus, longs to gather us like chicks under his wings, the loving mother who always cares for her children. From my previous speakers, uh, my, my friends here. So um, I do have a handout that Ivy is going to um, give you. So we're really going to try and look at scripture itself.
itself to understand where does the feminine appear and how does it appear in the scripture for Muslims happening, and which happens to be the Quran. So the rightful place to begin this conversation is at the very beginning. Our respective scriptures that guide the lives of all Jews, Christians, and Muslims. However, unlike my two friends here, my job is definitely much harder. I'm speaking to you on a subject about which we all have been socialized to accept as negative. The normative discourse on Muslim women is similar to the one on the concept of jihad. Outmoded, violent, oppressive. Inequality and oppression of Muslim women is projected as one of victimhood defined by a misogynist faith and tradition. Such oppression is regarded by many intellectuals, social activists, feminists, as well as the media, as an indispensable fact. Such thinking also applies to many Muslims as it does to non-Muslims. In fact, there is a thriving, lucrative industry of so-called experts that exists on the subject of oppression of Muslim women. These saviors of Muslim women happen to be presidents of nation states of the civilized world, military generals, former Muslims turned Islamophobes, pseudo-scholars, and many other experts in the business of hate mongering. However, having said that, one must acknowledge at the outset that such perception of Muslim women is also due to the horror stories that we encounter in the media. Aside from the media spin, we have to acknowledge the crimes committed against women in the name of Islam. Be it the story of honor killings in Canada, or a dastardly act on the precious life of a young child activist, Malala Yousafzai, fighting the distortion of scriptures by the Taliban in Afghanistan, or the young girls sent back into a burning building for not being fully covered in Saudi Arabia by the modesty police in 2004. <laughs> All of this happening in the town in which the Prophet of Islam was born and raised where he raised the status of women from slaves to independent human beings. Hence, my job of presenting the facts from the scripture on equality of genders against the dominant perceptions is obviously not going to be easy. Someone like myself will either be classified as an apologist by some non-Muslims and as an innovator of faith by Muslims. <laughs> Further, being a whale woman myself, it is sometimes harder for uh, some to separate the issue of oppression even from my own person. Now having laid all of this out, all the risks and challenges, I will try my best in the next 17 minutes to attempt um, separating facts from perception and allow us all together as a group um, to come to our own conclusions. What I've shared with you are some verses from the Quran, which is the scripture of uh, Muslims. So the purpose of these verses is for us to collectively examine um, whether or not the Quran promotes um, inequality, patriarchy, or privilege of one gender over the other, or does any of that have to do with stuff that we've already heard about, translation as well as exegesis that always presents a binary vision of men and women. Before I do that, um, I want to share with you what the focus of what I will be doing today is going to be. So I want us to understand the feminine in the Quran itself. Secondly, I separate that understanding of the feminine from the tradition, 
which involves human intervention. And thirdly, um, to examine the influence of male interpretation on Quranic exegesis, because it was a male trait and has remained so for a number of years, um, with some positive trends uh, happening currently. Um, and then to re-examine, acknowledge the re-examination and re-interpretation of the Qur'an um, by leading female scholars, uh, especially those who are in North America. So let me begin with a quote from Professor John Esposito. Some of you may know who he is. He is the person who, at Georgetown University who runs the Center for Christian Muslim Dialogue. He says, the daughters of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, or Hajar, have inherited a religious legacy that is not only the product of divine revelation, but also of human interpretation. The word of God mediated through the words of human beings, overwhelmingly male and patriarchal. He further notes, as the theological and legal interpretations have endured down through the ages, the line between sacred revelation of law or law and human interpretation has often become blurred or even forgotten. Truly, these two quotes summarize what I would like to convey to you today. And um, to do so, I'm going to uh, have you all imagine that you're sitting in a mosque. And uh, there are going to be two different sermons I will be delivering. One at Mosque A and another at Mosque B. So here goes. Here's Mosque A. Dear brothers and sisters, today we shall reflect on a very important topic. One that we do not talk about enough. The status of women in Islam. Islam, unlike what others think of us, came to liberate the women from bondage. The only difference between a man and a woman is the level of piety. Islam ended female infanticide and raised the status of a woman to an equal partner and a comforter. Islam gave women the right to vote, study, travel, even fight in an army. Islam gave a woman complete economic independence and made marriage a blessing, not a bondage. Islam gave women the right to choose to divorce rather than live in oppression. I want to remind you of the tradition of the Prophet that paradise lies at the feet of your mother. And you must never ever treat your mother with disrespect. Remember, the Prophet himself was most concerned with the status of women and kept reminding the community to take care of our sisters, our wives, our daughters, and to treat the women for well, even in his last sermon. His example is the one we must follow. It's a road map for us all as to how we should treat women. Nothing that this imam delivering the sermon, sermon says is untrue. Is holding very true to the scripture. Everyone listening to this sermon feels wonderful. They leave the mosque very empowered and recharged. Even though the women that have been listening to this um, sermon are relegated to a space that may not be so pleasant, but um, it may also be that the person who's delivering the sermon will refuse to meet with them because he doesn't like to meet with them. Now let's move to sermon number two. Dear brothers and sisters, possibly remember there are no sisters in this congregation. <laughs> <laughs> As you witness the natural disasters afflicting us around the world, it is time to ponder how we are paying for immoral and immodest behavior of our women folk. When you have women becoming like men, going to school with men, wanting the same job as men, working alongside men, dressing like men, and neglecting their families and children, we should not be surprised by the natural calamities we are facing. Our faith warns us about women being fitna, the 
word translates as a source of enticement and social discord. We also know that most of the residents of Hellfire are women. <laughs> if our sisters would stay home, obey their fathers, brothers, and husbands, we would not see these excesses today. The West has corrupted us. We need to rise up against this tide of westernization and have our girls live in modesty in their homes, protecting their honor and dignity. We men are their protectors, and we know that women are weak in their faith. They're not capable of making right decisions. They are prone to committing sins. We must discipline them. Look at all the traditions. And then he goes on to cite a bunch of misogynistic traditions. What more do we need to convince us that the purity of our societies depends on the honor of our women? If you're surprised by this, be assured, these are the sermons a majority of people around the world still hear. Here's a perfect example of mis mixing misogynistic interpretations of the Quran using weak and unsubstantiated hadith literature to create an image of a woman completely contrary to the image of a woman in the Quran. One other intriguing aspect for me personally is why are the male scholars so obsessed with the business of women? <laughs> Are there really no pressing issues that need to be studied, investigated, and clarified? Is it possible for them to get over the idea that the Quran rejects the puritanical and ex extremist idea of a Muslim woman fulfilling her obligations of faith through men? It is disheartening to see how male patriarchy has succeeded in hijacking the Quranic revelation and return to the patriarchal trends present in the pre-Islamic times. Now, justice is supposed to be the essence of Islam. So if justice is at the core of Islam, and equity and justice must also then govern gender relations. So the puzzling question is, how have women been pushed into inferior and marginalized positions while using the exact same scripture. While the Prophet himself has such a positive view of women, concerning himself with issues of women in Revelation, as well as through his own teachings, treating them as equal partners in all areas, how is it that later scholars and jurisprudence reverse this progressive trend to a pure misogyny? As long as a misogynist tradition deprecating women um, is in circulation, one really cannot expect much change. What is expected of reasonable Muslims, anybody who has a brain, is to really not accept any tradition that is a human creation which contradicts the scripture. It's very simple. It's very interesting that the Muslim women themselves have played and continue to play a huge part in keeping these myths alive. And in fact, to a large degree, they aid and abet this level of misogyny. It is also interesting to note that there is a growth in opponents of religious feminism. And often, sadly, it includes women. In fact, the term feminism sometimes is an anathema in the Muslim community. The Quran does honor a woman as an individual, not as a man's property, as a wife and partner in a just and equitable relationship, as an honorable mother, as a ruler, such as the Queen of Sheba, as a spiritual leader, the best of women world will ever see, Mary, as an intellectual accepting her fate, not because of custom, but because of causal reasoning, Khawla, who caused a revelation to happen because she refused to accept that her husband would call her. Oh, there was a customer at that time, they would just declare a woman at the back of their mother. 
She refused to accept that. The Prophet had no answer. There was a revelation answering this woman. The Quran frees a woman from bondage of original sin, values her sexuality rather than condemning it as an inherently sinful thing, gives her freedom to engage in lawful and dignified professions rather than exclusion from public life, gives her independence to marry whom she pleases and divorce with mercy. The first person to accept Islam was a woman. The first job that the Prophet received a job offer was from a woman. The first person to comfort him post-revelation with amidst such animosity and aided him throughout his mission was a woman. The Quranic ideal woman has been lost in the maze of legal codes and exegesis governed by patriarchal bias. It's the absence of female voice in the Quranic commentary that defined women from a patriarchal position. To give, I don't have time to go over all the women in the Quran, but because this is a very important time for Muslims, the time for Hajj, the annual pilgrimage, I just want to allude to the most beautiful story of a woman that um, has now become, or was established as a pillar of the faith of Islam, um, which is the pilgrimage. It's the story of a woman called Hajjah, a woman who was the earliest of Muslim reformers, an activist, a woman of absolute, the best exemplar of a faithful woman who refused to just be dropped in the middle of the desert until she was convinced this was God's will. And once she was there, she had to figure out her own means of finding sustenance for herself and her child. This is a woman that same Archangel Gabriel spoke to. Mary is also the same woman that Archangel Gabriel spoke to, the same angel that spoke to the Prophet of Islam. Currently, as the people who are on pilgrimage and Hajj in Mecca, it's the footsteps of Hajjah they are reliving. Whether they're running between the hills of Safa and Marwa, or recreating all of the other rituals surrounding the sacrifice of Abraham, it was this woman who established it. It is also this only woman who is buried around the Kaaba, called the skirt of the Kaaba. Many Muslims don't recognize that fact. However, let me end this on a positive note and then we'll look at some of the, the things I've given you. I want to shift our attention to um, the scholarship on, on Muslim women, on gender equity, um, that is truly at the forefront of examining the cultural practices and reinterpreting traditions um, while separating them from scripture. There is truly much to celebrate in the ongoing scholarship of women engaged in making a difference, especially women who have developed a hermeneutical approach to reading the Quran from a female inclusive perspective. The prominent one that you may or may not have heard of is Professor Amina Wadud from Virginia Commonwealth University, who makes the case that a hermeneutical approach to the Quran must include women as an active agent in both the intellectual and physical creation of the social order. She reclaims for women a rightful place as God's vice gerent or a khalifa, as directed by the Quran, and makes women both the agent and subject without the interference of the outside agency. There are many others besides Professor Madhu, uh, professors such as Aziza Al-Hibri, Asma Balras, Amira Sombol, Rafat Hassan, and many other women who are truly dedicated to reform and reconstruction as insiders, not as outsiders, not as critics who have given up this faith, not as people who have an agenda, but these are genuine scholars who are engaged in looking at, at the scripture itself and engaging in this process of reclaiming their faith. Using gender issues in Islam to serve political ends, be it the Taliban or the occupying forces, is not the agenda of these scholars. And it is truly their aim to end oppression um, in their communities. Aside from scholars, 
I could tell you tens of other Muslim social activists who have been doing this work uh, uh, for a lifetime. And I could name numerous other women who have devoted their time and energy to this work for centuries. Um, and, you know, not just as scholars, but as people who really are getting their hands dirty in the community. Such women really uh, deserve our admiration and support in what I call their jihad to end oppression. They don't need our armies to help them fight. What they need is our understanding and appreciation in, in aiding them to revive the Quranic ideal of gender justice. And I truly believe that uh, given that women are recipients of oppressive misreading of the Quranic text, it is the women themselves who have to engage and explore uh, the liberatory aspects of Quranic teachings. The inequality and discrimination of Muslim women has no roots in the Quran. Rather, it emanates from the Quranic exegesis and traditions or hadith, um, both of which involve human intervention. Having said that, is it possible to read the same scripture with a different lens? The his history of Quranic exegesis is a proof that it is. So, in my opinion, um, it really rests on the women to reverse this trend. I know, uh, am I over my time? No. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, I won't go over this, but what I've given you is um, verses about the feminine from the Quran with a few notes, um, but I'm just going to allude to one uh, here. You can, you can look at it and we can discuss this later on. Um, but the one that, uh, you know what, we'll just discuss it later. I don't want to take any time uh, right now. But this is something that we can talk about. Thank you very much for this. of the scripture. Um, one um, woman who identified being Christian made me, um, uh, I thought was a lovely comment about not knowing enough about her own Jewish heritage, um, as in the practice of Christ being Jewish. Um, it was a big surprise about the uh, financial backers of Jesus being women. Um, 
uh, a note, a sort of a comment that um, all seem to have a real patriarchal slant in terms of men um, generally being the rulers and all others being subservient. Um, we had um, some discussion about um, how is it that all three faith traditions so radically missed out on the reality of the texts? Um, how, how exactly did they also consistently misinterpret the text in regards to the roles and importance of women? How is it we all had the same Sunday school experience of women being negated? Exactly who wrote that those curricula. Um, there was a, a comment also about uh, a commonality often being a negative response or reaction to women um, and how prominently women featured at the beginning of spiritual movements and yet somehow with the institutionalization of them, um, women's power and presence um, became really diminished. Um, and so some discussion about um, the institutionalization of, of faiths um, did they somehow become more political than faith-based? Is the focus rooted in power rather than faith? Um, and um, how women are often central figures in uh, religious beginnings, but not necessarily in their um, progression. Um, and talked about um, the desire and perhaps impossibility of separating church and state. Uh, real um, exploration of how um, an interest in how the, the dominant culture, the secular culture, if you will, uh, informs the, the faith. Um, and so that was um, an interesting piece for us as well um, about uh, how the, the dominant culture affects um, religion. Did I miss anything? Our group, no. our group. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just supposed to be a praise meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Lori, there you are. Yeah. Thank you. So, I think the main thing that we focused on was looking back at going back to the original sources. Um, my group can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that was the main thing that we discussed. Um, we looked at it as a language issue. How far back do we have to go in order to get to the real root of scripture? And because of oral tradition in two of the three, um, we found this could have been this could be very, very difficult. We also talked a little bit about who benefits from the stories that we tell. Um, one thing that we looked at was power and how there's a lot to be said in, especially Jesus, I know that one the best, sorry, um, where Jesus says a lot about being a rich person. Um, and that's very difficult to hear. And women have seemed to be picked on as something that is easier to understand than figuring out how to get to heaven as a rich person. <laughs> so, we were looking at the hijacking of scripture, and I think the main question that we had is, how do we go back to main scripture, and how do we, how do we change it? How, how do we, based on the information that we were taught in Sunday schools, um, how, do we, how do we understand, and how, how can we make people understand what the real root of each scripture base is? And that's something that we were we were talking about a lot. Um, I grew up in these things. Thanks, Lori. Mara. I'll just uh, say you because I'm not going to be long. Uh, our summary is going to be very brief as we touched on a lot of things in the general So, uh, my group, if you want to add something, please by all means go. Um, we start off talking with our discussions, talking about the different approaches to all of the, the presenters took and uh, what might be some of the connections and some of the things that they were and how they were approaching mm -hmm. um, uh, or similarities or you know, differences. Um, but one of the things that, um, that we talked about was uh, the recovery of, of understanding the feminine from outside the religion versus reclaiming what's already there well, when you are within the, the tradition um, and learning from, from the source. And uh, towards the end of our, we talked about, um, um, we had Carol in group and had a question for a client that we'll all get to hopefully uh, look at it within the large group, so we'll, I'll leave that up to you to, to raise. Um, and then we had started talking about the theme in the our um, discussion about groups of women within each tradition and how um, it, they should be working with each other 
coordinating with each other uh, within the tradition. So uh, that's just a brief snapshot of all of those different mm -hmm. things. If anybody wants to add, you know, we talked about a lot of different things. So, mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Let's begin. So, so the table's turned now, you see. We listened to all of your presentations and now you've heard this feedback. So let's begin with your comments, observations on what you heard in the summaries, and then we'll meet each group with some specific questions. And no particular order. Can we just ask the time? How much time do we have? Go into the questions. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, one minute, should we move for the questions or we're not going to have time? I just wanted to kind of, yeah. Um, just an opportunity for any uh, comments or observations from, from the summaries that you heard. Again, was there anything in those summaries that surprised you? They're really not. <laughs> they're good. They're good. Okay. Let's let's do it in the opposite order then. So, Mary, you have, let's start with a question from your group. Carolyn, you were not. Okay, so my question was um, was for you specifically, and we started talking about it in the group, um, and it's a, around the perception um, from Christians of the position of Jewish women in Second Temple times, which is the in Christian terms during Jesus' time, and comments that you had made about um, girls having very little value and unusual for women to have property, and and although there were certainly differences from a Jewish perspective, my understanding is that that would be a really different perception than that. And I'm just wondering how that comes from, and you had mentioned about the Greek, the possible Greek. I think, yeah, there's some overlay from, yeah. from I mean, the Hellenization of Christianity, which is when it began to move from um, a, a group of, Christ, of mm -hmm. Jewish people who had con become Christians right. to predominantly Greek, um, and therefore spread out in Roman but also, it, the culture generally at that time was patriarchal and it would be less likely for a woman, maybe not to have money, but to have the say over how it was spent. Mm -hmm. So to take your life savings and follow this itinerant rabbi across Galilee would be mm -hmm. unusual. Um, and that in a patriarchal society, there is less value placed on real children overall than on male children, and less value placed on children generally than on adults. Um, and that Jesus would, in the story of Jairus' daughter, it's not like the girl comes to him, but he goes out of his way quite a distance, um, as if to say in his eyes that they're equal. And, and the fact that the father um, comes, I think, and, and does that, you know, drags this guy to his house, and it seems from the story that it's a bit of a distance, that he cares enough for his daughter to do that is also, um, I think, an important part of the story, that, in, that many of the people who heard the story, and, and I think, Unfortunately, maybe even still in some areas today when, when that story is told because some of the problems of the misogyny is cultural. Um, some of the, for instance, Christians and Muslims who live in a similar country will actually be much closer in their cultural understanding of the place of women um, than you might you know, expect from our North American perspective. And for them to hear that a father went to all this trouble to save his daughter and that Jesus cared enough to save a daughter is I think important in today's society, particularly to hear that story that way. Maybe not so much in North America, um, where there's at least lip service given to gender equality and gender justice, but in countries of the world where um, girls are very much treated, you know, as second or third or fourth class citizens. Thank you. And I would just, and we'll go on to other things, but I would just want to say this is one of the wonderful things about us having the time mm -hmm. to talk. I cannot disagree more strongly mm -hmm. with what you just said. <laughs> so, yeah. so at another time, in another context, to talk about, from a Jewish perspective, my understanding of place of children, of, of women, even though I acknowledge some of the difficulties, mm -hmm. is really different. And one of the painful parts of being Jewish is Christian misperceptions. We feel, we feel, Christian misperceptions of these very topics that and many people would absolutely reflect what you do but from a jewish perspective it's really different and amy Lil, some of the books i brought um uh, amy jill levine's 
um, New Testament from a Jewish perspective really addresses some of these issues, and I think there's so much room for more respectful and caring discussion about these issues so that we can understand them in a different way. But thank you. I appreciate it. I just want to comment on that comment, is that that's the no dialogue, not the argument, but yeah, that both yeah. of you interpret and history yes. shows and that we live with diversity is about acceptance of difference and not arguments about difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes. that, that is yeah. the, that's the no, don't follow the theologians in some council 500 years ago who yeah. pronounced it because they've been wrong enough. So now create a new reality with yes. a new truth. Mm -hmm. Lori, a question from your group. Um, I think our main question is how do, how do we go back to original scripture? Um, and how, how, do we, how do we bring that back to the masses? Yeah, because like, we can't, it's really hard to go into somewhere and say that um, what we've been believing all these years is wrong. People don't take kindly to that. Um, so how? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so how, how do Jews, not Christians? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that, 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 yeah. Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. So it's really hard to look back at original scripture and see what the real truth is in order to bring that back to the masses. And I think that's our main question. I think it's, as we were talking about it, is that it, it goes back to the idea that it's not that it's not there, but it's just um, um, a couple of issues. I mean, accessibility uh, for those, you know, that are in Arabic is not the, the best language. Uh, there are enough translations to confuse any ordinary person. So, you know, depending upon the translation you're looking at, you get a different uh, translation of the same thing let alone going into interpretation where all of the other human commentary comes in. Uh, so given what culture you're from and what translation you're reading and which scholar has then interpreted it and provided you a description of what he thinks that particular thing means is what primarily people there will accept, unless there is enough capacity, especially for women on their own, to do this studying on their own and approach it with fresh eyes. Um, I mean, I think that is a challenge that uh, when you have a scripture in a language that is not your own, that poses first. And the second is moving away from the tradition of always accepting someone else's interpretation as the only interpretation. I think for Christians um, who are looking at Old Testament um, the, um, scriptures, to invite Jews to give a perspective will give you a really, because Christian interpretations of Jewish scriptures are clearly going to be different than Jewish interpretations of scriptures with people who actually know Hebrew on a different level than, there are some Christian scholars that are amazingly fluent in Hebrew, but many Christian scholars have studied some Hebrew but don't have the fluency that Jewish scholars do and don't have the history and the ethnicity and, and the whole 3,000 years of culture behind it. So. Christians invite Jews to come and chat with you because you'll just find it fascinating and read Amy Jill Levine's um, commentary on the New Testament and from our perspective. Just to add to that, um, in the case of the Quran, the biggest problems have erupted from those who have, from a Western perspective, those who studied Arabic and tried to exactly. superimpose their own oh, meanings yes, onto yeah. The scripture. So and I remember asking you which one should we read right. because in some of our interfaith dialogues as I'm trying to read the Quran I realize that it's all in English and it depends who translated and where their head is. Where. So I was asking Arusa which one, which translation. So not only reading? does it vary amongst Muslims who are translating the same scripture but then you have an outside agency. Yeah. Uh, so it becomes multiple agencies trying to you know, put layers on the exact same scripture. <laughs> so, so which translation do you <laughs> <laughs> From a feminist perspective, there's a, a new one that was done by a woman called the Sublime Quran, by Lada Bhaktia. It's yes. in your, um, yeah, you can do that. Um, and the other one that I have taken the translations from is Abdul Halim. He comes quite close to the a simple um, English translation of the Arabic. 
Uh, again, you know, some of the verses, as I have pointed out in one, where I made a comparison, you will still see, you know, he's coming from one plane and she's coming from another. So, <laughs> but in terms of plain English, and I'm trying to capture the Arabic as it is, I find it quite useful. Every, every translation is an interpretation. Exactly. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But some are better than others. <laughs> it's important to ask, like in this case, you know, to ask someone who's a scholar in that field what are yes. the best ones, because certainly among Christian scriptures, there are some yes. that are very much interpretations um, and, and don't hold very true to good translations of either the Greek or the Hebrew. And, and so that's important to realize that. I think the other thing is to read them yourselves and not to worry. Sometimes when we read the scriptures, we worry too much about understanding every phrase, every verse. Read the scriptures the way they were written, especially the stories and that, um, because then they become a part of you and it's easier to think, well, well, what did I just read? Well, that doesn't make any sense from, with what I know of, you know, the scriptures over here and you can go back, but sometimes we read, um, people of faith read scriptures in very arbitrary ways. Like you read so much a day because however you're studying the scriptures, you know, 15 minutes a day or you're following, you know, the Bible through the year, um, commentary or something. And that doesn't give you the same flow as picking a book of the scripture and reading through it. Um, that flow can be very helpful, I think, and it helps people get back sometimes to the original sensible experience. And, and in addition to that, uh, for the Quran, I think it's always important to remember anybody who's picking up a Quran to read that you're reading the interpreted translation of the Quran. Mm -hmm. It's not the Quran. So no matter what you do, you're never going to get the original scripture. <laughs> it feels so subjective of me to feel and think that so many, especially personal interpretations, are actually misinterpretations yeah. um, based on a lack of understanding of context, which I may not scholastically mm -hmm. go and seek out. And yet, I appreciate it. It's a bit of a conflict for me, Tanya, when you said, you know, what does God say in your heart, or what what is speaking to you, what resonates with you personally, and and reading such words might resonate a certain way, but it's not the intention at all, and I, because I don't understand the context, or it's never been explained to me in a way that um, makes sense for the faith, then I'm cheating myself out of the reality of the meaning, and it's it's really challenging. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing tension, I think, for people of faith to, to do that, to hold, try and hold together the two, and to trust that because there are scholars who have no faith at all and yet who work you know with the scriptures of the traditions um, and I think they come at it from a different point of view slightly of but trying to trust the tension itself is and you know we are people of tension for the most part we live best in paradox and tension and well not <laughs> easy most easily but maybe most fully I don't know <laughs> this keeps life from being bored <laughs> And today certainly was not boring. <laughs> <laughs> I had checked with Ileana and she said there wasn't a specific question was coming and you felt right. it was it was covered in some of the others. We've only only scratched the surface here. But the good news is there are two more sessions. <laughs> and uh, we won't we won't cover everything in those either. But in your package there is a flyer that describes the two sessions that are coming up, one a month, one in um, a November and one in December. Please go copy this, share them. There's no copyright on this. Um, and invite others to come and participate in that. Also, in your package, there's a feedback form. We are very much learning as we go here. We will read every bit of feedback and would really appreciate it. And this will help shape our next session and what we do with that. So please give us your honest feedback. And mostly, thank you very much for coming and being part of this dialogue. Um, for many of us, it's just beginning. And you're welcome to stay. I want to honor the end time for those who need to go. But if you want to stay, um, I know I'm not rushing off, I'm locking up. And if you want to keep on having some conversation, uh, please do. Uh, huge thank you to our presenters uh, who were given, as I say, a very challenging task and rose magnificently to the occasion. Thank you all. <laughs>